All right, so let's get started. How you doing? Can y'all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I take you guys have your exam tomorrow. Um, if you guys want to start with any opening questions, we'll take those. If not, we'll go straight into the study guide. Ale, um, in zirconium, when you add uh, yttrium, you know what I'm talking about, right? Which one? Uh, when you add now uh, yttrium and magnesium, that it blunts the cracks. Which phase does it uh, stabilize, and what's the difference between adding yttrium and magnesium and only yttrium? Okay, so there's two phases you should know: the Austin type phase and the Martin type phase. There's a question that we're going to go over on that one. Um, the way they use it for stainless steel is they apply, I think it's chromium and chromium and nickel to stabilize one of the two phases. Okay. And each one stabilizes only one particular phase. Um, but that's for um, stainless steel. Like what, what she's referring to is, is for ceramics. Oh, ceramics? Yeah. And like the different um, oxides that are added. So like what happens is that um, with yttrium with oxide, it stabilizes in the, in, in the tetragonal phase. But what happens is that at some point, um, at some point, the precipitates become so large that it starts to un it starts to undergo an unwanted phase transformation to the monoclinic. So what is done is that magnesium oxide is added in order to blunt the crack because, like, due to the increase of volume um, and the particles um, compress, which stops the crack from propagating. And it says that it's partially stabilized. The question, my question is, is that when that happens. Um, is it just partially stable between the T and the monoclinic phase or does it become fully stable at the tetragonal phase? And if so, why is it that the factor toughness is, is higher in just, the, in just the phase with just the yttrium and is lower with the yttrium and, and the magnesium? Okay. No, yeah, I really haven't, really haven't gotten over that one in our class. Uh, we went over the stainless steel and titanium, why they have different phases, but not, not for ceramics. But I'll see if I can find something on that and check back with you later. Okay, for sure, thank you. All right, so let's just get straight into the study guide. So for this study guide, uh, these questions are taken from a previous exams, I modified a bit. So first one is multiple choice. It talks about someone with an artificial implant and having a case of, a case of non-inflammation or some minimal capsule formation in the past six months. And the most likely, answer for that one would be that the implant is porous. So the most likely they have development of some ceramic implants that they have porosity in it and that allows for local tissue ingrowth to occur. And we know that it's not infected because infection is, is highest after implantation. So this is one. Number two talks about the biocompatibility, biocompatibility of metals versus ceramics. So that probably has to do with how it works when it's implanted inside the body. Ceramics obviously have higher biocompatibility, but metals suffer more due to their, if it's not a noble metal. So noble metals would be like gold. Gold would be a, a great example of a noble metal that would be, that would elicit a minimal bodily reaction. So the physiological response to, is due to the higher energy state of the metal. And because of it, it corrodes within the body, the ions, because of ion attack and also proteins in the body and enzymes but also because of other factions like crevice corrosion. So the metal implantation itself might have some crevices or some jagged surfaces that allows it to locally have a different electrochemical potential and therefore weaken the structure. That would also lead to stress cracking. Another one would be stress cracking. If you have cracks in the metal implant, then you're gonna have crack propagation and it becomes worse when you're, ex when you're exposed to water and bodily fluids grain boundary corrosion and electrolytic galvanic corrosion. So the reason we have the solutions for each of these for stress cracking would be you have a mechanically sound device. Crevice would be you make the device smooth. That's why most biomedical devices are, are chamfered or filleted. For grain boundaries, it's difficult to address post-manufacturing. That's why you want to make sure the device is really, really well manufactured at the moment of. And electrolytic occurs when you have two different materials, in this case metals, within the same device. When you choose a device, therefore you wanna make it have a homogeneous selection. So you're gonna alloy it. So it's gonna have different metals, but it's gonna be one alloy. Any questions so far? 
I have a question. Um, the question that you put there says, um, right on top, it says that there's, um, why are metals less biocompatible than ceramics? But doesn't ceramics also have grain boundary uh, problems, like, um, like grain boundary? Yes, they do. They do also have grain boundary problems, and also because of their ionic properties that it comes from. Yes, they do have grain boundary issues, but the corrosion also occurs in the grain boundaries. And metals, since they have this higher energy state, they have, they're more exposed to that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So it, it exacerbates because of metals in high energy state. But you're right, ceramics also have those complications. And so those are just basically addressing the biggest issues with metals and how you can address those as an engineer, which are pretty simple. You make it, make the device smooth, you make it have less cracks, make sure it's mechanically stable so that it would be exposed to less crack propagation. And you make them of the same alloy. So different alloys won't help because you're gonna have electrolytic corrosion. For number three, describing this because polymer degradation and the physiolog physiological response to metals. So kind of like number two, except that in number three, polymers degrade in several forms. One of the easiest ones is random scission, where just the polymers start falling apart at different ends of the chain and they get cut, depolymerization, and the plasticizing effect of water and polyamides, which are proteins in the body which increases the amorphous phase of the polymer. And because the amorphous increase, the overall structure is gonna decrease. Number four, it talks about steel. So the answer for that would be that 316L is not ferromagnetic. And that there's a reasoning for that. He try, kind of tries to trick you there with the Austin type phase and the Martin type phase, but Nickel stabilizes the oxytide phase, and the oxytide phase actually has a FCC structure versus a BCT. For number six, it's just a ball and socket problem, similar to a previous one from exam one, except that this time there's no Poisson's ratio. And he wants to find, he wants you to compare the effects of dynamic loading. So, one thing versus static loading and dynamic loading is that static loading is how much load a material can handle. When it's, non, when it's not in movement. Dynamic loading would affect it because if you have, let's say, if you're running with weights, then it will be much harder for you to run with the same weight than if we take the weight and lift it stationary. That's my analogy. And the gist of it is that it's when a, a structure is in motion, it would, it would be able to carry less load than if it was stationary. But in terms of finding the stress and the strain, and he's gonna give you an SN curve, so the SN curve is basically where you take the limit and you calculate whether a material structurally would be sound forever, if it reaches a 10 to the six, or if it would fail at some, at some point in repetition of cycles. So we calculate that, and we can see that in this case, once you do the calculations, you look at the graph and you, would, you compare this value, 6.867 mil, mil Megapascals, megapascals, and you compare it in the graph and see that it passes this threshold of 10 to the 6, and you can say that it that it passes, that it lasts forever. And here it is, the effects of dynamic loading versus static loading. That's my analogy. For number seven, which statement is least accurate? And all these are actually true. Hydroxyapatite is compatible, compatible with bone. That's why it's used in ceramics. Grain boundaries are susceptible to corrosion. Yes, they are because of the, not because of the orientation of the minerals. So let's say the crystal might be the same crystal, but the orientation of the crystals also matter. And if they're not oriented in the same at the same degree, then you're going to have corrosion at those boundaries because they're not the same. You're going to have different orientations. Amalgam is what they use in in uh, tooth fillings and is made of mercury, silver, and tin. Cobalt chromium, so it's good for teeth life. That's why it's used in uh, lower limb prosthetics or femoral implants. Carbon fibers are stronger than carbon in the bulk. The bulk. And this is true because of the fibers forming a stronger alloy, especially when it's mixed in a composite than just having a carbon in the bulk. For number eight, 
talks about the piezoelectricity and synthetic materials. I know last semester when he talked about this chapter, we went over pyroelectricity, um, ferroelectricity, piezoelectricity. Piezoelectricity is one property where if you can mechanically change the shape of a material by applying electrical stimulus to it. And so it's useful because if you it's used for transducers in ultrasound where it's produced a mechanical vibration, in this case sound, to see the baby and then or the structure that you're looking for, and then it's reverted back, this sound, and is read by the transducer and converted by converted by the piece electric transducer into electrical stimulus. So the unit cell for that is called perovskite and the artificial name for that would be PTZ because it's made of lead, zirconate, titanate, and this is a structure. Now the reason why it actually works for biomaterials bio and for rebuilding bone is because of the Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law basically tells you that it's a, it's a theory for explaining how bone can rebuild itself. So what it does is you're gonna get local stimulus at a local electricity at the area of injury, and that stimulus, because of the piezoelectric properties of bone, is gonna recruit the osteocytes to stimulate rebuild. Any questions so far? Would barium titanate be another another material that could be used? Or another like for for piezoelectric materials? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if it would, but the check marks that he does go over is that for you to be piezoelectric, you need to be asymmetric, first of all, and allotropic. So if you're neither allotropic or asymmetric, they are not going to have piezoelectric material. So a barium titanate would be one of those two, then, then you're right. But off the, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. So number nine, it talks about... <laughs> the strength of a material after it's implanted and how this strength degrades with time. And there's a formula here that you, you guys can use. And what it, this is basically plug and chug. He's gonna want you to calculate the um, original strength of a material following with just information of after implantation. And this is pretty small formula and you'll be fine. Number 10, it's gonna be a scenario where he tells you it's more application-based, where he gives you a scenario and you guys have to provide recommendations. So a patient is wounded by a, a firearm accident and they're rushing to the hospital and they want you to give as the biomedical engineer recommendations on how to proceed with this surgery and the reasonings behind that. So this can be anything you want it to be, just as long as it has justification and your explanation and has a scientific backing up. So you want to remove, first of all, the lead round because lead is not a noble metal like gold is. And even gold has a passivation with the body. So usually when metals, when pure metals are in the body, you're going to have inflammation at its worst or actually at its worst necrosis because it's going to have infection. But at its least, you're going to have passivation. So what does that mean? It means that at its, in the best case scenario, you're going to have a capsule formation around this material but that only happens in the best of noble metals and this is not a noble metal you're gonna have this is a lead round so you want to remove that first of all because it can lead to oxidation and infection you also want to disinfect the local and neighboring regions because the risk for infection is at its highest when you have bacteria present so you want to disinfect that and depending on the type of bone fracture the surgeon wants to go for a ceramic and a bone plate, you can recommend also metallic composites with pores to, a, in, to exhibit ingrowth of the tissue. And this one's an extra. If you use a PMMA implant, then you wanna be aware that the blood pressure of that patient might drop because of, I'm not really sure honestly, but you wanna in that case prescribe pharmacological treatment in order to compensate for this blood pressure drop. So I did give you some practice problems if you guys wanna go over them or talk about it and some hints for, for where you can find the answers in the book or in just flat out gave them to you in the case of number 12. So for number 11, it's basically going over the sterilization types that you can use 
and the pros and cons for why you would use it. So in this case, Beckman Culture has one for a metal composite knee joint, a polymer catheter for cardiac diagnostics and arthroscopy for shoulder and knee surgery. So some general trends, if it's metal composite, then you can use a lot of sterilization types. But if you're using a polymer, then you're usually constricted in what you can use. For example, dry heating can melt some polymers. Also steam can be bad for some polymers because of the amorphous phase and the plasticizing effect of water. There is also ETO, which is ethylene oxide, that can also hurt some polymers. So those are some setbacks that you would use against polymers. There's also UV radiation with cobalt. You would use radiation with cobalt and to sterilize the device. And I think the last one, I think those are the general things you can use. ETO, dry heating, steam, which is called autoclaving, and UV radiation. But each one has its pros and cons. Usually the most, the most general one people use is ETO, but the, there are also certain instances where you cannot use ETO and most likely being related to polymers because it attacks the polymer. Two forms of cellular response in pathological and non-pathological. -pathologi this diagram kind of oh, summarizes. So yeah, if you, so if, if for like that answer for number 11, you would just say the like the best kind of sterilization, sterilization technique for a polymer, you would say probably just ETO, but like it does have its setbacks. Yeah, so the thing with ETO is that it's a chemical. Mm -hmm. And so the chemical when you expose it to polymer and some polymers can actually break it down. So generally, as a rule of thumb, ETO works and it's actually the manufacturing standard. But in the case of polymers, you want to be careful because ETO is a chemical and will break it down. Okay. If it's a metal, then you're more liberal in terms of options. So you have more options available. You can use steaming, you can use dry heating, you can use UV radiation and ETO. But again, you have to be aware of polymers is more, more delicate. Either way, in this, in the hint that I gave you, that summarizes the effects very well in much more detail than what I'm doing right now. And you for sure will find the answer there. So for number 12, the diagram describes it very well. And it's not only limited to metals, you're gonna have also other sort of pathological and non-pathological conditions or think for implants that are made of other materials like bone cement or degradable materials. Number 13, what is non example of an interaction deformation during ceramic deformation? And the answer for that is none of the above. The reason why it's none of the above is because plastic deformation does not occur in ceramics. Plastic, uh, ceramics are elastically brittle, so they break once they reach their elastic yield. Suzuki effect applies to metals, so does control cloud. Viscoelastic response applies to polymers and other things like metals that has plastic deformation, ceramic does not. And in that case, all of the above would be all of the above and that's not, that's not the case. Number 14, provide a thesis brief description of each of the following. So wound healing and in device implantation in relation to cell physiology. So it kind of relates to the physiological responses that we've gone over before, like inflammation, capsule formation, passivation, when you have an implant. And there's, there's a hint if you guys wanna look at it in more detail. He does go over specifically, uh, and very briefly, I believe the optical properties of devices. And for that, he goes over Snell's law, which is basically, if you have a light at an angle and it refracts or reflects through a material, then what are the producing incident and reflection angles that you get? And so for that, I would say draw it out. So you're gonna have the light coming in and it's gonna re reflect at an angle and you're gonna find that the, just the angles that it makes. Um, I thought that Snow's Law was used for angles, that, angles of refraction. Yes, it is. But in this case, you're gonna find the reflected angle. So you're gonna have an angle that goes through and an angle that gets reflected. He wants you to find just the one that's reflected. Okay. So for number six, it's more of application based towards cardiovascular implants. And he wants you to list three different classes. So for those, the biggest winners 
that I, that I can remember off the top of my head is nitinol. So that would be a metallic clash. A ceramic clash would be more of, would be more of pyrolytic carbon. You see, it's not a true ceramic, but he still mentions it because of its low uh, friction constant. So because of its low friction constant, constant you're gonna, it means that it's gonna be less of a tissue response because the blood will be able to flow more clearly or, or flow more fluidly. And so that would be a meta um, ceramic class. And then a polymer class could be a catheter or a, any other type of cath a catheter. So those are three general classes that you can use and the applications for that. Nitinol is used for stents because of its memory shape properties. If you design it a certain way, it will retain that shape. So it's good for the cardiovascular implantations. Ceramic, you wanna use pyrolytic carbon because it has a low friction constant and it elicits a less tissue response. So there's, there's less tissue growing onto, let's say this pyrolytic catheter. And for a polymer, you can make a polymer composite for mm -hmm. catheters. Number 17, what is one degradation mechanism involved in ceramics and what may exacerbate it? So it was mentioned before, stress cracking propagation. So if you have mechanical load in the presence of a stress, of a mm -hmm. crack, then you're gonna have a crack propagation. And what exacerbates it basically is water. If you have a ceramic exposed to water or exposed to proteins in the body, then that would lower the maximum yield point and the maximum, uh, yeah, the maximum yield point of the ceramics. Number 18, what are the roles of molybdenum and nickel towards processing stainless steel and what are its biomedical applications? Molybdenum and nickel, they have their own purpose in stabilizing certain phases, either the, the Austin's type or the Martin's type phase or it just helps with reducing, reducing corrosion. So it helps with corrosion resistance. I think that's the one for molybdenum. Molybdenum reduces corrosion and nickel stabilizes either the osteocyte or the martensite phase. Yeah, molybdenum would, um, would, prevent, would prevent pitting corrosion in stainless steel and then the nickel would um, stabilize it in the austenic phase and which would help with corrosion resistance as well. Yeah. And then I guess for like the second part, like what are the biomedical implications? You, like you just say that like it just helps to resist corrosion in both cases. Yep. For number 19, uh, he went over this in class, the pore bay diagram. So it's basically a diagram that tells you where or where within the region would a material either oxidize, be immune to oxidation or oxidize on the surface, which is called passivation. So it's based off the pH and the electrolytic, the electrolytic zone of the area you estimate to put it within the body. So each, each zone within the body has a special electrolytic property. And so you would just draw a generalized orbit diagram and you draw the different zones. You're gonna draw the zone of oxidation, the zone of passivation, and the zone of immunity. But the thing is, the Porbit diagram does not tell you the rate at which the rate of oxidation or the rate of corrosion. So reasons that we ways that we can use to overcome this is one, you might want to do a empirical test where you take Ringer solution, which is a solution that approximate the, the, the human body, and you would test it, you would test the material you want to, the metallic material in the Ringer solution to see at the rate at which corrodes. So first you get the Porbit diagram, you say, you say, okay, it corrodes, but we don't know at which rate it corrodes, then you do the empirical test. Or if you say, or if you just see that it passivates, then you might want to call it a day. Because if, if it passivates, then it's going to create a protective surface to prevent further, further oxidation or further corrosion. And for number 20, it's uh, the lens maker equation. Yeah, um, excuse me. Yeah, about 100. So like for like when you're drawing the poor box diagram, um, for different metals, the regions can be a little bit different in terms of where they're, in terms of where they're located. Um, for sure. Is there like a is there like a general way to draw it, or like can we just like choose any metal or just choose any diagram and just draw it like in that in that? When scenario? I when I took the test, he didn't ask this question, but the one I remembered was iron. I remembered iron, 
and that but you can draw a generalized one which is probably the one he gave you where he just gives you three regions but surprisingly in real life there's more there are several uh let's say several regions so it's not just three regions there could be multiple passivation regions or multiple oxidation regions okay. and the one i remember the most is iron Interesting. so for number 20 the lens maker equation and that one's just basically a formula that he gave you and it was mostly plug and chug from what i remember and this these are the formulas that he's going to give you and the one for the lens maker equation is the one that he hand wrote with the one divided by f equals n minus one. That's the lens maker equation. Any questions you guys might have? So for um for the lens maker equation, do you just have to be you would have to make sure that all the units are in meters, or or does it like would you have to like do conversions, or is, or is millimeters fine here? Yeah, I think millimeters are fine. And uh, he's not he's not a big iffy with the with the units as long as they're consistent. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Um, on the, on the review he gave us, he wanted us to do like uh six three for the wear, the wear um fractal equation. So when I looked at the example, I don't know if you can go to break anything, but I think for the load. They didn't give us a load in the figure, but he had like 43 point something in the book. Like where do, where would we find that by looking at the graph, if you know? Oh, so we're talking the dynamic loading? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the graph, the one he gave us was the, the exact same one for test one. Let me see if I can find you the exact same one. But basically you want to look at the curve and the curve is going to flatten out. So it's gonna just slope all the way down. And in this case, if the calculated stress reaches that that limit, then it would just be structurally sound forever. So let me see if I can find you the, the specific one. Any other questions? Um, in your experience, does he usually like give like the the same questions? Because the thing is, is that for like our class, he wasn't able to get to 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 chapter ten, and yeah. for chapter nine, he only got to like the derivation of the load on the collagen and the load on the mineral. So I feel like the test is going to be a little bit more since we didn't get to that point, and like I, I was looking at the study guide, and a lot of it is like chapter like ten ish unrelated. No, yeah, uh, I remember. Most of the questions, these are actually repeated from old tests, but I'm not sure if he's changing it up now with the whole social distancing thing or with online stuff. We were lucky last semester that we had it halfway. So we were in that transition phase and we didn't have honor lock either, but I'm not sure. I have no, I have no idea, bro. Sorry. And that's good. Cool. I just wanted to like him. And you think he was saying um, in class that the outline that he gave us is going to be more like the test, the review sections that he gave us online. Yeah, it was pretty straightforward what he's mentioning on the test. Uh, most likely, the bone, mineral, and collagen phase will be on the test because I think he asked us to derive it at home. So it was part of our homework. I'm not sure if he assigned you any homework, but the, the once he does assign for homework, it will be on the test pretty much. Alejandro, what's your final honor look? No, it wasn't. It wasn't on our lock. Mm -hmm. Trying to see if I can find the what I had submitted for my exam too, because You're that, that because that has the graph, the S N curve. Okay. Was your final cumulative? As well? Yes, it was. It was completely cumulative. So we saw things from exam one. Okay. Okay. And then the same format, right? Say again. It was the same format as the first two exams. Yep. It was uh, 10 questions more or less, and there were, some multiple, there were a few multiple choice actually. There were, I think one or two, most of it was application-based and listing and, or short paragraphs of what you have to write. We had to draw some things. For example, uh, when you guys talk about valves, artificial valves, we had to list them out, draw them, list their applications, their pros and cons. That took me about two pages worth of writing. So, there will be a lot of writing for a final. And then um, 
when you get the chance, uh, if you could, I don't know if you can look on the book, example six six. Um, the the way they answer the question, it's like it's like calculated, like it's using the proof stress test. Um, the way they did it was just like a little weird, and I wasn't able to like kind of like figure out the example. If you could like maybe take a look at that, that would be like really cool. So chapter six, example six. Uh, yeah, chapter six, example six. All right. It's on page one sixty six. Write it down. So the PDF page or the book page? Uh, the PDF page. Okay. But yeah, that, that pretty much, if you guys have, are having no more questions, that pretty much concludes it. If you guys want to get this document, then just join the group. It's right there with the QR code. Just scan it. You'll be right in the group. And we'll be posting this shortly. And to answer, I know someone uh, asked about the Essen curve. Um, I'll, I'll just, just if you stick for five more minutes, I'll be able to get the, my previous exam and show you like what I, what I wrote for our exam. So you can see the S and curve. Okay. But uh, that just pretty much concludes our review. And so you guys can go ahead and practice those problems that we went over. Uh, most of them are probably from the book or from old exams. Then you'll be in good shape because this, this is material since like think, I think two or, two or three years of exams worth. So a lot of questions taken from there. For those of you who wanted to see my, my old exam, uh, here it is. So I can share screen with you. This is my old exam. I can find it. It's right here. So that, that's mine. For the number six, the one that was that goes on forever, that's it's this one. That's literally all we put. So for those, it'll be the BS and curve. So I'll give you a graph like this. So you guys can see it. Let me take off this. It'll give you a graph that looks like the Yesen curve. And it's just give you gonna give you this graph. And it's gonna say, oh, this is in water, or and this is in bone. And it's with with a uh, with the data points. And so you're gonna calculate this number and you're gonna compare it to right here, you're gonna compare it to this limit. And you're gonna go down here and say if it reaches a threshold of 10 to the next, 10 to the six. Like this. And so in, in that case, if the number you calculated with your stress and your strain actually passes this number with that is at 10 to the six, then in that case, you can say that the material lasts forever because it is structurally sound. So no number, no number of cycles or repetition of cycles would be able to make this material fail. And so that would be your answer. Any last questions, guys? Ale, you said uh, a, specific, a specific polymer for um, cardiovascular application? or a, spe a specific polymer for that one? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I do know for ceramics is pyrolytic carbon. And for metallic, it would be nylon. But polymer is actually the easiest one. I just don't remember right now which one it is. I was trying to put in a poly, uh, poly PTFE. Oh, Teflon. Yeah. yeah. That works. I was trying to put the, okay, okay. Thank you. That, and then also, you said that uh, lead, uh, zirconium. Yeah. Something, that was perovskite, right? Yep. That's the one's perovskite because it's used for piezoelectric. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other takers? All right. So we'll be posting this recording on our group chat. Same thing with the with the review. If you guys want to access it, just scan the QR code on my on my page, and it'll take you right there. Thank you so much for coming, guys. Bye, Alejandro. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, See you. Ali. Yes. This is on. Um, this is recording. Are you also posting this on the WhatsApp? I didn't notice that. Yes, yeah, so we'll be posting this on our group chat.
Ah, okay, perfect. Thank right. you. Have a good one. You too.